Hello, Adrian Heritage Explorers. In this next series of videos, we're going to be exploring some of the historic sites of the American Civil War. So please sit back and enjoy. Welcome, Mystery and Heritage Explorers. Today, we will embark on a journey through history to explore the significant events surrounding the Battle of Fort Sumter and how this pivotal battle led to the establishment of the Fort Sumter National Battlefield Park, preserving its historical significance for future generations. <music> Our story begins amidst the turmoil of the American Civil War era. The election of President Abraham Lincoln in 1860 and the subsequent secession of several southern states highlighted tensions between the North and the South. Fort Sumter, located in Charleston Harbor, South Carolina, held significant importance as a federal fortification within Confederate territory. Following South Carolina's secession from the Union in December of 1860, U.S. Major Robert Anderson, who was commanding the only two companies of federal troops guarding Charleston Harbor, was facing the reality that his position at Fort Moultrie, due to its design as a coastal-facing defense, was vulnerable to a land assault if the conditions between the U.S. and the newly formed Confederate government turned hostile. Because of this situation, Major Anderson elected to abandon Fort Moultrie and relocate to the more easily defensible Fort Sumter. Built on a man-made island about two and a half acres in size, Fort Sumter was designed to house a garrison of about 650 soldiers and around 135 artillery pieces. This fort was part of a coastal defense program implemented by Congress in 1817, and when Major Anderson relocated his troops on it on December the 26th, 1860, the fort's construction had not yet been completed. South Carolina militia forces soon would seize the city's other forts, including Fort Moultrie shortly after, and that would leave Fort Sumter as the only lone federal outpost in Charleston. On January 9, 1861, a ship called Star of the West arrived in Charleston with over 200 U.S. troops and supplies intended for Fort Sumter. A battery on Morris Island, manned by cadets from the South Carolina Military Academy, fired upon the ship, forcing it to turn back to sea. With the inauguration of President Abraham Lincoln in March 1861, the situation soon escalated. Anderson and his men were running out of supplies, and Lincoln announced his intentions to send unarmed ships to relieve Fort Sumter. The Confederate government declared that any attempt to resupply the fort would be seen as an act of aggression that would not go unanswered. South Carolina militia forces scrambled to respond. On April the 10th, Confederate Secretary of War telegraphed General P.G.T. Beauregard the instructions to demand the evacuation of Fort Sumter. If those demands were refused, the general was to reduce the fort. 
Bogart replied that the demand would be presented to Major Anderson at noon the next day. April 11, 1861. Headquarters, Provisional Army, Confederate States of America. Sir, the government of the Confederate States hereunto forebode any hostile demonstration against Fort Sumter in the hope that the government of the United States, with a view of an amicable adjustment of all questions between the two governments and to avert the calamities of war, would voluntarily evacuate it. There was a reason at one time to believe that such would be the course pursued by the government of the United States, and under that impression my government has refrained from making any demand for the surrender of the fort. But the Confederate States can no longer delay assuming actual possession of a fortification commanding the entrance to one of their harbors and necessary to the defense and its security. I am ordered by the government of the Confederate States to demand the evacuation of Fort Sumter. My aides, Colonel Chestnut and Captain Lee, are authorized to make such demand of you. All proper facilities will be afforded for the removal of yourself and command, together with your company arms and property, and all private property, to any post in the United States which you may select. The flag to which you have upheld so long and with so much fortitude under the most trying circumstances may be saluted by you on taking it down. Colonel Chestnut and Captain Lee, for a reasonable time, await your answer. I am, sir, very respectfully your obedient servant, G.T. Beauregard, Brigadier General Commanded. Anderson read the demand and asked for time to consult with his officers, who agreed with him not to give up the fort. Major Anderson drafted an equally polite refusal. Fort Sumter, South Carolina. General, I have the honor to acknowledge the receipt of your communication demanding the evacuation of this fort, and to say in reply thereto that it is a demand with which I regret that my sense of honor and my obligation to my government prevent my compliance thanking you for the fair, manly, and courteous terms proposed and for the high compliment paid me. I am, General, very respectfully, your obedient servant, Robert Anderson, Major, 1st Artillery, Commanding. Bogart consulted with Confederate officials in Montgomery, and late that night he sent his messengers back to the fort with yet another politely written proposal. Headquarters, Provisional Army, Confederate States of America. Major, in consequence of the verbal observations made by you to my aides, Messengers Chestnut and Lee, in relations to the conditions of your supplies, and that you would in a few days be starved out if our guns did not batter you to pieces, or worse to that effect, and desiring no useless infusion of blood, I communicated both the verbal observations and your written answers to my communications to my government. If you will state a time at which you will evacuate Fort Sumter and agree that in the meantime you will not use your guns against us unless ours shall be employed against Fort Sumter, we will abstain from firing upon you. Colonel Chestnut and Captain Lee are authorized by me to enter such an agreement with you. You are, therefore, requested to communicate with them an open answer. I am, Major, very respectfully, your obedient servant, G.T. Beauregard, Brigadier General Commandant. Now this message reached Anderson after midnight. The Major took his time writing yet another oddly polite reply, and in the early hours of April the 12th, he presented General Beauregard's aides Chestnut and Lee with his answer. April 12, 1861, Fort Sumter, South Carolina. General, I had the honor to acknowledge the receipt by Colonel Chestnut of your second communication of the 11th instant and to state and reply that cordially uniting with you in the desire to avoid the useless infusion of blood, I will, if provided with the proper and necessary means of transportation, evacuate Fort Sumter by noon on the 15th instant, and that I will not in the meantime open my fires upon your forces unless compelled to do so by some hostile act against this fort or the flag of my government by the forces under your command, or by some portion of them, or by the perpetration of some act showing a hostile intention on your part against this fort or the flag it bears, should I not receive prior to that time controlling instructions from my government or additional supplies. I am, General, very respectfully, your obedient servant, 
Robert Anderson, Major, 1st Artillery Commandant. Now this was unacceptable because the Confederates wanted to prevent the arrival of supplies. The Confederate officers left the fort at 3.20 in the morning, leaving a warning, though very politely, that the bombardment of Fort Sumter would begin in one hour. April 12, 1861, 3.20 a.m., Fort Sumter, South Carolina. Sir, by authority of Brigadier General Beauregard commanding the provisional forces of the Confederate States, we have the honor to notify you that he will open fire of his batteries on Fort Sumter in one hour from this time. We have the honor to be, very respectfully, your obedient servants. James Chestnut, Jr., aide-de-camp, Stephen D. Miller, aide-de-camp. Chestnut and Lee stopped at Fort Johnson to inform Captain George James that he was to fire a signal gun at a specified time to start the bombardment. At 4.30 in the morning on April the 12th, at Fort Johnson, a gunner in James's mortar battery fired his mortar, launching a projectile that arched high over the harbor and burst over Fort Sumter. Major Anderson's men made their way to the safety of the fort shelters. A few more guns opened up as the citizens of Charleston gathered to watch the battle. Soon. Every Confederate battery in the harbor that could reach Fort Sumter was firing. In all, Major Anderson only had 85 men under his command during the battle. In the morning, he divided his troops into three groups who would man the fort's guns in two-hour shifts. Because of the lack of manpower, gunpowder cartridges, and the lack of protective cover due to the incomplete construction, the use of the fort's guns was limited and inadequate. On the second day of bombardment, Confederate hotshot fired from Fort Moultrie set Fort Sumter aflame. Confederates on Morris Island were so in awe of the defenders' bravery in the burning fort that they began to cheer every shot fired from Sumter. About 1 p.m., a shot had snapped the flagpole and brought the Stars and Stripes to the ground. The falling of the flag inspired a Confederate officer named Louis Wigfall to jump into a rowboat and head out to Fort Sumter on his own. There, he met with Anderson, who said that he would abide by the terms that he had informed Beauregard of previously, but added that he would immediately evacuate instead of waiting for April the 15th. Wigfall departed to deliver the news. By 1.30, the firing had stopped, and soon after Wigfall left, another boat docked at the wharf carrying the same Captain Lee who had brought the original evacuation demand. Lee explained that he had come to the fort because the garrison's flag was down and a white flag had been raised. Major Anderson explained Wigfall's visit and was informed by Lee that Wigfall had no authority to negotiate any deal on behalf of General Beauregard. By this time, Major Anderson was pretty upset. Captain Lee asked for a written version of the same terms that Anderson had dictated to Wigfall. Anderson agreed not to open fire again until Beauregard had the chance to either accept or refuse these conditions. Word came back at last that these conditions were acceptable to Beauregard. The garrison would leave after firing a salute to the tattered flag that they had bravely defended. General Beauregard refused to claim the flag as a war trophy and instead allowed Major Anderson to keep it. No Union troops had been killed during the bombardment. But Private Daniel Ho died almost instantly when an explosion occurred during the artillery salute held before the U.S. evacuation. Private Edward Galway, who was also wounded in this explosion, would die a few days later from his injuries in a Charleston hospital. The Union garrison led by Major Robert Anderson violently defended the fort, but unfortunately surrendered on April the 14th after a 34-hour bombardment. The Battle of Fort Sumter marked the first military engagement of the Civil War, becoming a pivotal moment in American history. Anderson returned to Fort Sumter on April the 14th, 1865, to participate in a victory ceremony. Before he raised the 33-star American flag that flew over the fort, he addressed the crowd. I am here, my friends and fellow citizens and brother soldiers, to perform an act of duty which is dear to my heart and which all of you present appreciate and feel. Did I listen to the promptings of my own heart? I would not attempt to speak, but I have been desired by the Secretary of War to make a few remarks. By the considerate appointment of the honored Secretary of War to fulfill the cherished wish of my heart through four long years of bloody war, to restore to its proper place this very flag 
which floated here during peace before the first act of cruel rebellion. I thank God that I live to see this day, to be here to perform this perhaps last act of duty to my country in this life. The events of Fort Sumter that day, however, would go mostly unnoticed and unreported due to being overshadowed by events unfolding in Washington, D.C. that very evening, the assassination of President Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater. The fall of Fort Sumter amplified the divisions between the North and the South, leading to an escalation of hostilities and mobilization of troops on both sides. This battle served as a rallying cry for unification in the North and bolstered the Confederate cause in the South. Its impact reverberated throughout the nation, altering the course of the U.S. Civil War. During World War I, a small garrison had manned the fort's rifles at Battery Hugger. After the war's end, the fort was not in use as a military establishment, although it was maintained by the U.S. Army. It did, however, become a destination for tourists until World War II had brought about the fort's reactivation. The Battery Hugger rifles were removed in early 1943, and 90mm anti-aircraft guns were installed on the fort's right flank. Recognizing the historical significance of Fort Sumter, efforts were made to preserve and commemorate this site. In 1948, Fort Sumter National Battlefield Park was established under the National Park System. This park was intended to serve as a memorial to the battle and as a place for visitors to reflect on our nation's turbulent past. It encompasses both Fort Sumter and nearby Fort Moultrie, which played a vital role in the defense of Charleston Harbor during the war. Today, Fort Sumter National Battlefield Park offers visitors an immersive experience and the opportunity to connect with the past. The park includes guided tours, exhibits including Major Anderson's flag, unexploded ordnance lodged in its walls, and interpretive programs that shed light on the Battle of Fort Sumter, the experiences of the soldiers and civilians during the war, and the broader context of the U.S. Civil War itself. With its picturesque location in Charleston Harbor, the park serves as a poignant reminder of the struggles and sacrifices endured by Americans during this turbulent part of our American history. As we conclude our exploration of the Battle of Fort Sumter and its subsequent designation as the Fort Sumter National Battlefield Park, we are reminded of the enduring significance of this extraordinary site. It stands not only as a monument to the bravery and sacrifices to those who had fought there, but also as a symbol of how we as a nation can learn from our past to better shape our future. Let us appreciate and honor the rich history preserved within Fort Sumter, enduring that its lessons resonate for generations to come. To learn more about the Battle of Fort Sumter, head into your local public or school library. You can also check out the description box for a link to the Fort Sumter and Fort Moultrie National Historic Park. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and share with others. And as always, thank you for the History and Heritage Explorers. Until next time, keep on exploring.
All right, boys and girls, come to Fort Sumter. It's the bomb.